This is lecture 5 of the Mundaka Upanishad and in our previous lecture we spoke about a very important subject and that was the analogy of the two birds in the tree. One bird enjoying the fruit of the tree and the other bird just watching. This was a beautiful analogy and often misunderstood. It is not the mind and the Atman in this analogy. It is in fact the Jiva Atman and Paramatman. Jiva Atman being that part which includes the mind. It's the vehicle which carries the Atman and Paramatman being the universal self. We continue from there and I will read from chapter 3, canto 1, verse 4. Knowing the truth that it is prana that shines through all living beings, a realized yogi takes no interest in pedantic discussions and debates. Rather, he delights in Atman, enjoys his meditation, and is considered to be the highest of the knowers of Brahman. Having discussed in the last session this analogy of the two birds, we should remain aware of the fact that analogies, spiritual stories, spiritual scriptures, all of these can become theoretical, can become intellectual. There is a great danger that those who are interested remain stuck at that intellectual or theoretical level. Rather than living these truths, rather than integrating these teachings in one's life. A yogi is not just some sort of image from the past, from ancient times, or some remote characters roaming the Himalayas. Those who are deeply interested have to go beyond intellectual study and theoretical analysis to live these teachings in their lives. It can begin just with the very simple practices. Simple things like change in diet, having a healthy diet, a sattvic diet. Simple things like organizing your life so that you are not putting in all kinds of impressions into your mind. To choose your company well. Keep the company of good people. It can be something as simple as a prayer in your own words twice a day, in the morning and at night. If you do these things daily and make these a part of your life, and if you're really sincere, you will even find a guide, somebody who will guide you along the path. Provided, of course, if you don't have one already. So, one who is living these things, living out these things in their life, integrating these things in daily life, show no interest in pedantic discussions and debates they realize the futility of these. They rather 
enjoy their meditation. They long for meditation. They long to experience that joy and bliss in meditation. For those of you who are doing some sort of meditation, some of you may ask, what bliss, what joy, it seems like such a struggle. It is true that in the initial stages, meditation can be a struggle because you have not trained yourself. The senses have not been trained. The body has not been trained. So initial stages can be a struggle also if you do not have a good guidance. But if you have good guidance, you're patient, then you will see that it's not really such a big struggle. And slowly and gradually, you will begin to enjoy the meditation as well. Then you experience delight. You experience joy, delight. You play. These are beautiful words that come from our scriptures, from tradition which has been handed down, the oral tradition, where we say the one who attains something is frolicking in the ocean of prana. It's, it's a play of consciousness. He's in delight. Delight comes from light, it's enjoying that light. And that is the difference between a theoretical or intellectual practitioner and a practitioner. Any questions? Any comments? I will read verses 5 to 9. <clears throat> they are very similar. So we group them together. This Atman can be experienced through constant practice of truth, tapas, right knowledge in Brahmacharya. Yogis avoid, devoid of all impurities, see this self-illuminated bright light within this very body. Truth alone wins, never untruth. The path leading to the divine is paved by truth. By following this path, the seers who are free from all desires attain the highest abode of truth. It is infinite, divine and indescribable and is subtler than the subtlest, further than the farthest. Yet to those who see it, it is very close, residing in the cave of the heart. It cannot be seen with the eyes, nor described with speech. It cannot be known through the senses, or achieved through austerities, or rituals and ceremonies. When, as a result of knowledge, his mind is purified and calm, the yogi meditating on the Absolute attains direct experience. This extremely subtle Atman, residing in the cave of the heart, can be known through pure intelligence. Prana has entered this body in five forms. Along with prana, mind pervades the whole body of living beings. When this mind-body organization is purified, Atman shines forth. We 
very beautiful verses, very deep verses. What are the qualities required to attain the Atman? Constant practice, abhyasa, constant practice of sadhana. We need tapas. Tapa earlier was always understood to be austerities, which, which sounds very negative in the sense of one has seen perhaps photos or heard about yogis who indulge in some sort of self-torture and harming the flesh. And that is not what tapas means here. Tapas means training, putting in effort. The word tapas comes from fire and when you put in a lot of effort into something, you feel a fire within you. If you work very hard for something, it could be any project that you have. It could be you know, you're taking exams, you want to be successful in that. Maybe you have decided there's a certain job that you want and you're working towards getting that. Or you have a long-term goal. You want to get yourself a car. Whatever the goal is, it doesn't matter. It requires effort. And when you put in effort into something... Over a period of time, there's a sense of a fire, energy in you. And that's what is meant here. Training yourself, disciplining yourself, so that you experience that fire. We need right knowledge. To know the difference between right and wrong, and to integrate that right knowledge in one's life. Brahmacharya does not necessarily mean celibacy. In the context of householders, Brahmacharya means regulation. It means not merely regulation of sexual desire, but of all desires. Brahmacharya. Brahma is consciousness. Pure consciousness. Acharya means to walk. To walk in consciousness. To walk in Brahman. And that's a beautiful feeling. If you think about it. To walk in Brahman. When you exercise control over the sense of speech. The active sense of speech. You will experience Brahmacharya. Right now are the four months of monsoon, which are in India, called Chaturmas, four months. In ancient times, not even ancient times, even just a few decades ago, it was quite normal that people cut down their activities in the monsoon time. Those days, the roads were not very good. When it would pour a lot, then, of course, um, it became difficult to travel, to move out of the house. That was also the time before there were cars and uh, other vehicles. So the monsoon time was also the time of a lot of disease and sickness due to you know, the warm weather and water contamination, etc. So there were a lot of rituals and traditions connected with that time, which stipulated what one should eat and what to do during that time. Since people could not travel much, they were bound to their villages and to their homes. Also the 
the wandering renunciates did not wander during that time. During the four months of the monsoon, they settled down in a village where every evening they would do pravachan, reading from the Bhagavad Gita and helping the householders with their spiritual growth. During this time of Chaumasa or Chaturmasa was also considered a good time for deepening spiritual practices, also for laypersons, for householders. People took vrats or vows. They would fast, they would not eat certain things during the monsoon, such as certain vegetables which con contained a lot of water were not eaten. There were other traditions as well, maintaining some sort of spiritual practice. So if one considers this and takes up a practice of mana, keeping a vow of silence for a few days, doesn't have to be for four months, just a few days, then you begin to experience a certain withdrawal of the active sense of speech. Actually, after a while, the sense of speech seems to subside. Even in the mind, thoughts calm down, you have less thoughts, and you experience a heightened sense of awareness, and you feel like you are really walking in Brahman. So with these little practices, one generates tapas, right knowledge, and experiences the truth through direct practice. And with such practices, systematic practices over a long period of time, one can experience this self-illuminated one in this very body. Often, there is a misunderstanding that when we attain the highest state, we simply die. Physical death is not implied. You can be a Jeevan Mukti, you can attain Sakshatkar and become a witness. It is only when your samskaras have been lived out, sort of dried out, then the body has no purpose anymore. Then there is physical death, but not before. A lot of people have fear in them that if I practice too much, as they call it, in inverted commas, too much, they will lose touch with this life. They will not be able to enjoy this life. And they might even just die. Yes, something dies. It's not the body. It is our false self-identities that die. And that is where this fear comes from. But when you allow these false self-identities to die, you become awakened to a far more beautiful world. Right here and now, not, not somewhere else, not some other plane of consciousness. I mean in this body you will experience a joy and a bliss that you do not know generally. And this joy and bliss, what is it like? It cannot be described. This great light, this being within, this light in this body, Everybody has asked this since times immemorial. People have asked, what is it like? For those who are on the path and who are practicing, they seem to be chasing a goal that they even themselves do not know. They have a purpose, 
which is not really clearly defined because they don't know it. They have not experienced it. It's only when one has that glimpse that you know where you want to go. But for those who haven't had the glimpse, they have asked, what is it like? And the seers say, it cannot be described. They say, not this, not this. It's, it's subtler than the subtlest and further than the furthest, yet it's very close. They speak in paradoxes. It is not a sensory object of sorts that can be known through the senses. So through the eyes or speech. It cannot even be achieved through austerities or rituals. By austerities it means here, it means um, those extreme practices which some indulge in or some to, to harm and harm themselves or rituals which are very external. So it cannot be achieved through all these external practices. To experience that in the cave of the heart, you need pure intelligence. Pure intelligence is the sharp buddhi. Buddhi is also translated in English as intelligence, sometimes as intellect, sometimes as wisdom, sometimes as the inner voice. All these translations are somehow inadequate. I have always preferred to stick to the word buddhi. It comes from buddha. Buddha means bodha. Buddha is light. And so that's that light in you. That's the closest to the great light. It's the most sattvic part in you. In your mind. Which is not Atman itself. It's a part of the mind. But it's, and it's not Atman itself. But it's the closest to that. So you need to have a very sharp buddhi. The prana, when it enters this body, and here we are referring to Adi prana, the first unit of life, Adi prana, enters this body and then it takes five forms. These are actually known as the five vayus and these are the vehicles so you can think of it as a part of the body while adi prana or prana is consciousness when it enters the body it takes a more gross form and these are the pranic vehicles which have certain functions so you have udana Vayu, which is upward moving. You have Samana Vayu, which is related to the digestive system. You have Apana Vayu, which is downward moving, related to elimination. All these are very important aspects of prana. They are not Adi Prana. They are at the level of the body. So prana and mind pervades the entire body. There is a belief among in modern medicine somehow that the mind and body are two different things. So a lot of people just separate them. So you go to a doctor, and you have a doctor who will treat a part of your body like a car mechanic who is treating a part of the car. He's not interested in the driver of the car. He's only treating a part of the car. So such doctors also have this attitude 
that the mind and the owner of this body is somehow separate from the body. And they will not ask you about your well-being. They will only ask you about that body part. No? What about your eyes or what about your, your stomach or your heart or whatever it is. It's a body part. But mind and body are one. And this prana is throughout the body. Life is throughout the body. When the entire mind-body is purified, Atman shines forth. Due to the nature of Atman, those who have not had their first glimpse of it will always struggle to understand it. And the seers only say, neti neti, not this, not this. You can ask them, what is, this? what is it like? And they will say, no, no, it's not like this, not like this. It cannot be described. Any questions or comments? Balaji is here. I don't know if you can speak, Balaji, but I had to think of you again when it said here it cannot be achieved through rituals and ceremonies. I listened to it. I'm sorry that I joined late. No problem. No problem. Yes. This is one of the few Upanishads which a lot of people think it is a ritualistic Upanishad because it is uh, talking about fire but at the same time it's a monk so people think okay it's maybe a Brahmin a fire priest is referred to so they sometimes think it's about rituals but the rituals are inner rites inner rituals any practice which is an internal practice is sometimes also called inner ritual for example um, in the there are three parts, you know, three general parts uh, in Tantra known as Kala, Mishra, and Samaya. The Samaya path, Samaya means I am with you. It's the highest path, and it is a purely internal path. The Kala path is external. It includes all these rituals, ceremonies, visualization practices. And the Mishra path is mixed. So there is some visualization, there is some external practice, there is some internal practice, it's all mixed. So in the Mishra path, where they have visual practices, visualization, they also do these external rituals in an internal way. It's called Manas Puja, the mental puja, internal puja. So that's a transition. I have often spoke about the importance of transitions and this too is one of those ways. Sometimes if a student is very much um, caught at the external level, then the teacher gives him practices that help him to transition to the internal path. And one of these could be Manas Puja, where some practices are 
given which are internal rituals. We will come to that, we will refer to that eventually. So in verse 8 then, um, when the rituals are mentioned, mm -hmm. it then only refer to the external rituals. Yes. Yes. Mm. Even the internal rituals cannot lead you to the highest. The internal rituals are also a transition. Because internal rituals, now let us take the fire ritual. The fire ritual, that's what this text is about. It is from the Atharva Veda. The Atharvans are the fire priests. I have mentioned this and I believe it was in lecture 2 where we spoke about it at length. I said that the fire priests were conducting these rituals and since most people think that this is about the fire ritual, they are a little bit confused about these kind of comments where it says, oh, it cannot be known through rituals. So then they get a little bit confused. The reason is that they are actually not promoting rituals. And the internal ritual could be, as a transition, the internal fire ritual also exists. And sometimes it is given to a student, to a practitioner, because he should learn to let go of the external fire ritual. But even the internal fire ritual is not it. In, this, in the path of Samaya, you have to even let go of that internal fire ritual. And that would be by learning pure awareness or how to pay attention. By merely seeing things, becoming a seer, samskaras are burnt. And that is the Samaya way. This, of course, requires guidance over really very long periods of time so that one transitions gradually from one level to another. It's a, it's a development. It's, you evolve. It's a long process, except for the few, very few rare adhikaris, it is a long process. Verse 10. A person with a purified mind can attain any plane of, con of existence or any object of desire. Therefore, anyone desiring to be prosperous should honor and serve the Noor of Atman. When you have purified, you can attain any plane of consciousness or object of desire. What does it mean to have a purified mind? Yeah. Purified mind is one where all the samskaras have been burnt in the internal fire of knowledge. I gave a little hint and I said there's an external fire ritual which is the Kala way. There's a Mishra fire ritual which is the internal ritual practice. And then there is the Samaya way, which is becoming a seer, seeing the samskaras, and by the very act of seeing, the samskaras lose their power over you. They lose their hold over you. Samskaras become what is known as burned seeds, roasted seeds. When seeds are roasted, they can no longer germinate. Similarly, once the samskaras have been seen, they lose their power to germinate. And that is why when the monk shaves his head, it is a, 
it's a kind of a physical or enact, enacting the, the 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 part about not allowing the seed to germinate it's a similar thing you cut off the hair and you don't allow it to grow anymore similarly the samskaras which are in the mind do not grow do not germinate they have been burnt in the internal fire and when they have been burnt in the fire actually you have no desires or you have desires have really been reduced keep purifying keep purifying keep purifying and then as you come closer and closer to the self become more and more powerful that one says that merely thinking about something will make that manifest you have heard of these stories of the wish fulfilling tree and the wish fulfilling cow kamadhenu wish fulfilling tree is also called the kalpataru so these mythological objects come from yogic realities and the yogic reality is that you become a kalpataru a wish fulfilling tree in our earlier session i also mentioned that you are the tree you are the eternal tree that was described and explained in the bhagavad gita so if you can fulfill all wishes because you have purified your mind then you become a wish fulfilling tree this is one of the reasons why a lot of people are pursuing shri vidya madhu vidya because they think this is about wish fulfillment abundance prosperity and this attracts of course all the wrong people because if you come to this path to fulfill desires it doesn't work because you have not purified because the mind remains at that external level it's only when you have evolved and the mind has been purified that you are at the level of samaya then this can happen so this is a longer process of purification it can get very difficult this process of purification for those of you who are doing deeper practices some of you tell me oh i'm i'm really so unhappy because there's so much to purify it's such a struggle and to these people i say it's difficult in the beginning but it gets really better the process accelerates it picks up it gets faster and faster so initially because you do not know how to do this it takes time and you struggle but once you get the hang of it the whole process accelerates and then one day you will become a kalpataru a wish fulfilling tree any questions survey on this last verse are you thinking and contemplating about it hello 
Yes. Um, yes, like I'm thinking like I have to do it like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, it's a long yeah. process. Yeah. And as it says, you can attain then once you have purified. So we come to chapter 3, canto 2. And I will read verses 1 and 2 together. Knowers of the Supreme Brahman know that the whole verse is supported by Brahman and shines through the light of Brahman. Those who remove all worldly desires and worship Purusha, pure consciousness, transcend the cycle of birth and death. By contrast, those who do not renounce all desires are pulled by their worldly desires and are born again and again amidst those very surroundings they desire. But for one whose desires are fulfilled and who is established in the self, all desires vanish in this lifetime. There are a lot of people who are on the spiritual path who say, Oh, the world is a terrible place. I don't want to be here. There's so much suffering and misery. I want to leave. I don't want to be here. And this becomes a form of escapism. But we cannot go anywhere. We are stuck here in this world. And escapism is not really a way out. Those who take to renunciation out of this spirit of escapism, they are actually going deeper into this because they are not dealing with their desires. They are denying them. The reason you are here is because your desires have pulled you into this world. You keep saying, I don't want to be here. I want to be free from this. Yet, you are here, and the very fact that you are in, um, embodied proves that you have some skaras that want to be lived out here. So what we have is a classic conflict. There is a part which doesn't want to be here, and is unhappy, miserable, suffering, all these things, and the other part which actually has a lot of desires and wants to be here and is, is uh, attracted to all these worldly objects. So this conflict keeps us here, bound. And so you are like a pendulum, you know, you go from one side to the other, you go from one extreme to the other. There are times when you're very spiritual and you, want to, you feel like you don't need anything of these external things. And then suddenly you get very materialistic and very attracted to all those external things. And so like a pendulum, you go back and forth. And that makes your misery even worse. Because it's exactly that duality that is the, that life. That is duality. This highs and lows, happiness, sorrow, pain, and suffering and joy and happiness. This keeps on and you, you cannot attain one-pointedness. It's only when this conflict has been resolved and we learn to live in this world, enjoy this world, because this is what we really wanted, but in a healthy way, so that we do not create obstacles for our spiritual development. And when you are learning to do that, 
you can also learn to burn up these desires internally as a Samaya approach or you manifest them. This path, there are a lot of misunderstandings, there are a lot of dangers, which is why the need for guidance. And only those who have really fulfilled their desires or who have no desires left, they remain established in the self. They are not born again and again. So remember this, you are pulled down into this world or forced into this world by your very own samskaras, your very own desires. They are not bad, they are not good. You may give it that colouring. You may say, oh desires are bad, oh des these desires are good. I have heard students say, oh I have this bad desire for more money or... I have this desire for, for relationships, family, all these things. And then say, some of them say, oh yes, it's a good desire. I want to uh, promote this desire for spiritual growth. And yes, you can look at it that way. All the same, it's all a part of duality. We must learn to distinguish between these two. But remember that ultimately we have to give them all up. Excuse me, Radhika Ji. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part, but ultimately... We have to give them all up. Whether the desires are, in inverted commas, good or bad. What we are calling good or bad. So all you the desires. You have to live, live them all out. Not all. <laughs> those which are healthy and can be lived out, can be lived out. But those that are not healthy, not useful, should, of course, be, would best be burnt internally. Okay. Through the yogic yeah, process. Live was the word that I couldn't hear, give or live. So yes. I understand now. Yes. Thank you. Yes. That's helpful. Okay. Good. Any further clarification or questions on, on this? These two, um, especially verse two, is very important because this is the crux of the entire vicious cycle of death, birth, death and rebirth. This keeps on and on. And those who are a little bit more sensitive, who have acquired some sense of discrimination, they feel that they are trapped here. They feel trapped in this cycle and they are looking for a way out, how to get out. Not an easy task, definitely not. That it's important to understand the root is these desires. And you are literally experiencing this being forced into this world if there is a part of you which actually doesn't want to be here. That conflict becomes very, very acute. Yes. Hello. Uh, yeah, Radhikaji, I wanted to ask one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the desires, like um, yeah, you uh, like desires, like they vanish once when they are manifested, or like uh, when we let go, like uh, it it go away, like once when it is manifested, or once uh, if you let go, it is it like that? Yes. Yes. 
uh, with with manifestation of desire, just wanted to clarify, with manifestation of desire, that's a dangerous path. And that is why I mentioned that one should have some guidance. What can happen is there are a lot of people who are going around indulging themselves in all sorts of things, you know. You go to some shopping mall and you'll see people, they're just uh, eyes are popping out because their desires are pulling them and dragging them all over and they don't know what to do and what to get and where to start. So that, that's, that's, that's a dangerous path, especially in the beginning. Because if you don't have control over the senses, you know, if you're not trained your senses, then you are lost. Remember the beautiful image of the chariot, the five horses, you know, and Krishna. If those horses are not trained, those horses stand for the senses. If they're not trained, all the horses are going in different directions. You imagine chaos, havoc. And so that path is a higher path when you have already trained the senses. If you have not trained the senses, it's important to first learn how to let go, and let go is still an intermediate stage. After letting go, you learn how to, to observe which is good, which is helpful, which is not helpful, and then those which are helpful, you can manifest, and those which are not helpful, you can let go. The process of let go is not... Yeah. Not so easy as it sounds. <laughs> yeah. 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 You said, uh, I think just uh, before that, like, um, you know, like letting go in internal fire or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like, this this one doesn't, like, you know, in very advanced uh, form of meditation or, like, you know, like anyone who just wants to let go of <laughs> some of their desires. Yeah. Actually, it's not so advanced as it may sound. It is merely, I have often said this, it's getting the hang of it. And that's the difficult part. But when you have done it one time, then you can repeat it. But the, the whole issue is how to get it that one time. If one doesn't sit daily in meditation and has not learned a complete process step-by-step -step systematic process, then chances are you will never get that moment, that magic moment, that grace, it is called, kripa, will never happen. So you have to sit there, you know, you have to do this systematic practice. Only then do you have chance of getting that kripa. When that kripa comes, when grace comes, and you have done it one time, then you will laugh you will actually laugh and you will remember my words and you will say, it was not so difficult at all. It was not, it's not so advanced. It's really about okay, doing so it every day. Yeah. So we need uh, Grace to finally let go. In that moment. <laughs> yeah, but didn't you, but now don't think that Grace means, oh, I can't do anything about it. Actually, that's the very next verse. It doesn't mean I can't do anything about it. I said, you have to sit every day and do that systematic practice. Only then grace will come. <laughs> grace is not coming otherwise. <laughs> if you never sit there and you never do your practice and you never do anything and you keep saying, oh yeah, I'm waiting for grace, <laughs> then you're going to be waiting a long time. <laughs> okay, thank yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So verse 3 actually uh, picks up from exactly that point where uh, we, we spoke about that with Survi. Verse 3 says, The knowledge of Atman cannot be attained through discourse, intellectual analysis, or even extensive study, but only to those whom it chooses does Atman unfold itself. In some translations, this verse has also been translated, that last line, as the self chooses the self, which leads many to the misunderstanding that I can't do anything about it. If the self chooses me, fine. If it doesn't choose me, too bad for me. So it becomes fatalistic. This Upanishad and all the teachings 
of the seers and the sages are not fatalistic. Quite the opposite. Absolutely the opposite. It says you should do your sadhana. And when you do your sadhana, it will happen. It is with any field of expertise, to gain expertise, one says you need 10,000 hours of practice. This was studies that were conducted in Germany, I believe, um, among violinists, so for violin, those who play the violin, as well as athletes. And they thought initially that certain kids are geniuses, you know, how, how are they able to already at the age of 14, 15 play so beautifully, there must be some sort of geniuses. What they discovered was, it was merely because they had started early. They started with four or five. By the time they became 14 or 15, they already had 10,000 hours of practice. So, that is the reason why it is very important to do practice. To gain expertise in something, you need approximately 10,000 hours. We go to school and we go to college and you study full time. We have done a calculation of this and very often I have told people about this <laughs> little calculation of mine and I have said that if you practice for one hour a day to get 10,000 hours you will need 27.39 years so about 27 and a half years to get 10,000 hours of practice. If you will practice every day for two hours, you will need 13 and a half years to become an expert meditator. If you meditate for four hours a day, you it comes down drastically to seven years. If you meditate six hours a day, you need only four and a half years to become an expert. Now, six hours a day, it's an interesting figure. It's a magic figure because it's a full-time job. So those of you who go have been to, to, to uh, university or obviously those who have been to school know that you're in school for something like eight hours, six to eight hours. You're not studying continuously. You have also lunch and break and things like that. But if you work out the hours where you're actually working, it's more than six hours. And it... To go to university, you have to do 12 years of studies in school. In university, you have another four to five years. And that's exactly the figure we're talking about. Four to five years if you go to university with six hours a day to become an expert in a certain subject. If you take up mathematics, you take up computing, computer science, you take up physics or whatever it is. So if you are really serious, then you need to devote six hours a day to sadhana and then grace will come because you have done your part. The self chooses the self, yes, but not if you don't do anything unless, of course, you have done it in a previous life. But you can't rest on those laurels because had you done it in a previous life, then that would have already shown forth. So the importance of practice, sadhana, abhyasa, has to be emphasized. Not discourses and discussions and intellectual analysis and reading books. You can read entire libraries on yoga. There are institutions in India, yoga institutions, where they have huge libraries. You can read all those books. Do you think you are going to break this cycle of death and birth just by reading books? You know you're not. I mean, intuitively, we all know that that's not going to happen. 
So practice, practice, practice. That's what we all have to do. Do our sadhana. If you do not have a systematic practice because you have not got guidance, then you should think about it. You can begin in a small way. As I mentioned already, begin with prayer twice a day in your own words. And if you have a systematic practice, then you should do it. Keep in mind that it is not a sort of a simple process like, you know, drinking a Coke or making some instant coffee. The modern student is sometimes very impatient in our world where things happen very fast. We are so used to getting instant results. A few early days you wrote a letter, it took you two weeks to get an answer. And now you get a response. If you don't get a response in five minutes on WhatsApp, you start getting impatient. So this impatience is not going to work here. This is a longer process of development. And this is already the shortcut. Any questions so far? Yes. I know that you talked about um, organizing time in for for meditation in four times, mm -hmm. four different times. And um, but in the event that there are longer periods, such as the four and six hours you were referencing, mm -hmm. um, is it is it the idea really that? Uh, you know, because if you look at the 24 hours in a way, it's like it's not really like that much of the 24 hours, like how one organizes it. Um, do you have any thoughts to share on, on that? In well, it's a matter of, of... In terms of splitting it up or anything like it, or you you still give the, the general way that you were saying, um, splitting the time across the four uh, times. Mm -hmm. Yes, you you see, because six hours is, is actually a lot of time, if you think about it, six hours of sadhana every day, very few people in our modern life can do it. And um, it can also become very exhausting mentally when you start going through the purification process to go through all these things. Now, because of our life circumstances, especially the modern student, we don't give too many sort of strict, uh, you know, uh, ways of, of doing this. Each person is in a different phase of life. Some are maybe unmarried, have a little more time. Some have children and have very little time. Some are maybe retired and have a different maturity and perspective to life, but maybe having other issues which are creating obstacles. So in every phase of life, one needs to look at it differently. Each person is unique. Each person is different. We cannot have kind of a standard approach to everybody. Which is why we say you need guidance in, in this matter. And you can break up those hours. If you have six hours, wonderful. If you have four hours, great. Most people don't manage more than one, those who are working or who have children. But if you do, then I would leave it to you to figure out which is the most convenient way of dividing. Most people find morning to be the most convenient time. They are rested after a good night's sleep. If they wake up early enough, it's still very quiet. 
the world, the surroundings are still quiet. And if they can do a longer set of practice at that time, that's very, very good. And if um, that's, that works for you as well, then that would be perfect, of course. Mostly people find the afternoon practice the most difficult to integrate because they are often at work and it's not possible to do long practices at that time. And evening and night, mostly people are tired at the end of the day. So it really depends on your day, how you have structured it, how your work schedules are, what kind of lifestyle you lead. You know, so there are many questions to be considered there. And there are no hard and fast rules about that. Ideal situation is to do four times a day. And if you can do four to six hours a day, that's perfect. That would be doing it full time, we say. And if you cannot do so much, then twice a day would be also an option to consider. You can take up something, whether it's two times a day or four times a day. Set timings for yourself. I encourage people these days, everybody has mobiles, so I encourage them to set alarms. And when one does this in a very flexible way, in spite of having an alarm, you can be very flexible. And it's a reminder, but it doesn't mean that you have to drop everything at that point of time. You know, okay, I need to do this now. And you do this wherever you are. It can be just a couple of minutes where you just say a little prayer in your own words. Or if you have the time, you do a longer, deeper practice. So to answer your question in one line, be flexible and see how you can integrate this in your life without creating more conflicts and more obstacles. Those of you who become then very strict and very rigid, also end up creating more problems for yourself. So don't do that. It should be integrated in such a way that it gives you joy. The idea is that it should make you happy and not miserable. I appreciate that very much, Radhikaji. Thank you so much. Thank you too. Very helpful. Yes. Okay, so that was a nice discussion today. And I think we are almost at the end of the, the Mundak we will probably finish it next time. So it's likely that our next session on Friday will be the last session for Mundak. And if it is, then after that, we will start with the essential yoga sutras. We will do only those yoga sutras that are really practical and make sense and not um, complicated things that people can't even begin to understand. So... That would be following the Mundak Upanishad. Okay, so it was nice to have you all and uh, see you next Friday, Ivan. Bye bye. Bye, Radhika. Bye. Bye, Radhika. Thank you, Radhika. Bye, Mitra. Bye, Bye, Balaji. Have a nice weekend. Yes.